Hello, my name is Stephen Shanley, and I'm the director of Allegheny County Department of Public Works. We originally wanted to conduct a field visit to the construction site of the Rachel Carson Bridge. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us revise those plans. There are multiple avenues for engineering students to explore, and we'll see a couple of those as part of this presentation. There's the structural engineering aspect of inspection and analysis, followed by incorporating those findings into a final biddable package. There is also the construction management and construction inspection responsibilities. We believe that by gaining experience while at school through internship or co-op positions, provides the engineering students such as yourself with a significant advantage once you graduate. We also believe that the learning and research that takes place as a part of the IRISE Consortium makes a significant difference in our engineering community and helps to produce the engineering leaders of tomorrow. That's why we're so proud to partner with the University of Pittsburgh Swanson School of Engineering on this important initiative. Our department maintains more than 408 miles of roads and 533 bridges and culverts. And that includes the iconic sister bridges downtown, which we'll talk to you about in this presentation. Our discussion will be divided into three parts. The history of the sister bridges, the structural behavior and analysis of self-anchored suspension bridges, and the features of the sister bridges. We will stop in between each segment for questions and answers. I hope you will find this presentation interesting and informative. With that, let me introduce to you Richard Connors, our bridge engineering manager, who holds two degrees from Pitt. He will be guiding you through this presentation. Good morning. This is a talk about the Roberto Clemente, the Andy Warhol, and the Rachel Carson bridges. They were formerly called the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street bridges, respectfully. For the purposes of this lecture, I will conveniently refer to them as the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street Bridges. The bridges as they exist today were constructed in the mid-1920s and came to be known as the Three Sister Bridges. This is because they are similar in design and have the distinction of being the only identical trio of bridges side by side in the world. They are often featured in the background of local news broadcasts, magazine advertisements, and were used in the logo for the City of Pittsburgh's Bicentennial in 2016. And here is a very nice poster that graced the walls in Benetton Engineering Hall just a few years ago. This is an aerial view of the three sister bridges taken a few years ago, before our current rehabilitation project for the three bridges got underway. The last part of the lecture today will include footage from the current 9th Street Bridge Rehab Project. But first, I want to share some background and history of how the Three Sister Bridges came to be. In this timeline, you can see that there has been a total of nine separate bridges spanning that reach of the Allegheny River going back about 200 years. The previous six bridges were owned and maintained by private companies who profited by charging tolls. The first bridge was designed by Lewis Wernag. There are no old photos available, but this was a wooden covered bridge on St. Clair Street, which later became 9th Street. The city, many years later, changed the names of several streets in Pittsburgh. The bridge owner operator of the bridge was the Allegheny River Bridge Company. Wernwag's covered bridge at 6th Street was replaced by John Roebling's suspension bridge in 1859. The bridge company thought a new Roebling bridge would be more attractive and increase revenue. This bridge featured two main spans of 344 feet. Here's the first 7th Street Bridge. This appeared in 1884 and was designed by Gustav Lindenthal. Lindenthal was also the engineer who designed the Smithfield Street Bridge on the other side of town over the Mon River. Lindenthal referred to his design at 7th Street as a suspended or inverted arch. Note how he stiffened the main cables with eye bars connected as trusses. Here's the second and Ninth Street Bridge, which opened in 1889. This was a Baltimore truss designed by the firm of Ferris and Kaufman. A year later, Mr. Ferris began designing the Ferris wheel. Note the relatively low vertical clearance under the bridge in the short spans, with a lot of piers in the water. This eventually became problematic for marine navigation and commerce along the river. By 1893, we had the third 6th Street Bridge appear. 
The previous roadling bridge was deemed to be inadequate to support heavier trolley loads and was replaced by this one, which was a Pennsylvania truss designed by the famed engineer Theodore Cooper. Between 1885 and 1902, Cooper published several important works on railroad and highway bridge design. His theories strongly influenced the adoption of wheel load analysis for railroad bridges. As I mentioned earlier, the bridges were owned by private companies. But during the latter half of the 19th century, there was a big lobbying effort by the public to make the bridges toll-free. There was much back and forth negotiating between the city, the county, and other interests. But eventually the bridges were taken over by Allegheny, Allegheny County and the tolls were eliminated. The bridges were free. In addition to the free bridges effort, another item of consequence was the passage of the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1889. This act is the oldest federal environmental law in the United States. The act made it a misdemeanor to fill or alter the capacity of, of any port, harbor, channel, or other regulated areas without a permit. The act was administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which fell under the umbrella of the War Department. Starting in 1889, there was increasing pressure from the federal government to open up the Allegheny River for the increased demand for navigation due, the, due to the needs of industry and commerce in the Pittsburgh area. Opening up the river meant the existing bridges had to be raised higher with longer, clear spans between the piers. This was a great idea, but somebody had to do it and come up with the funding to make it possible. This opinion from March 1917 was the final decision by the War Department, which ended nearly two decades of back and forth negotiations between the parties. This is the last page of the document with the decision by Secretary Newton Barker. He said the bridges were an unreasonable obstruction to the navigation of the Allegheny River, and the immediate elevation and relocation of the piers was in the national interest. The bridges had to be raised to 47 feet above the pole elevation of the water at the Davis Island Lock and Dam, located in Avalon. And this is a screenshot from a conference I attended in 2016 at the International Bridge Conference. This slide summarizes very well the federal perspective on major bridge crossings. The bottom line is that mariners have the right of way. Beginning in 1917, the county started to process to comply with the decision of the War Department. The county commissioners promoted a bond issue to raise funds for construction for a large group of projects, and a number of design concepts were proposed. This is a concept for a vertical lift, lift bridge at 7th Street. And this is a concept for using a three-span arch concept at 6th and 9th Streets. In total, four concepts were submitted but disapproved. Approvals were needed from the Corps of Engineers, City and County Planning Departments, the Pennsylvania PUC, and the City Art Commission. So the county had to go back to the drawing board. Here are new proposals that were made for 6th and 9th. This concept featured a truss with an upward curving top cord. The county thought it was a good idea to break the monotony and have a different concept for 7th Street. A cantilever truss was proposed. These news articles indicated that things were moving ahead. The revised concepts had gained approval by the federal government and the local planning departments. Here things were looking good, but there was one final approval needed from the City Art Commission. County architects made renderings for the Art Commission. Plans and re renderings were submitted to the Art Commission on June 6, 1924. A few weeks later, things were still looking good. Approval was a foregone conclusion, with approval by the Art Commission just a formality. However, the Art Commission disapproved the plans. They didn't like the idea of having heavy steel structures above the water, and said they preferred a more aesthetic design, such as a suspension bridge, to give better views of the city. This decision absolutely stunned the county officials. They were forced to go back to the drawing board one more time. 